Any woman could do that, couldn't they? <laughs> I never realised. have quite a pair of horses, perhaps, yeah. I never realised you walked so fast with it. They should go a little bit slower. I mean, mm -hmm. these only just come out of the stable, so give them half a day at that and they'll steady up. Yes. Uh, Tell me what about the different bits of this bar. Yeah. Um, you just start at the front. Yeah. yeah. You got wheels on. Uh, this we bar. got wheels on it. You don't have to have wheels. Uh, it certainly makes the job easier for the wheels, but. The conditions we've got today was very, very muddy. It's probably best to use them now without wheels. The swing plow. Mm. Mm. It's much more difficult. You've really got to have a steady pair of horses yes. to use the swing plow. But the wheels basically determine the width and the depth of your ploughing. And depending on what you're growing, uh, it depends on the depth of your ploughing. I'm ploughing with a four and a half, five inches deep and about nine inches wide. And the wheel measurement from the inside of the furrow wheel which is the big wheel uh, that runs in the furrow measurement from the furrow wheel to the knife coulter which is that one is your width of your plant of your furrow and that's determined by altering the wheel obviously take the wheel in mm. the narrow furrow took it out and it's a, it's a wide furrow and then the small wheel which is the land wheel and runs on the land the difference in the height from the measurement from the bottom of the of the land wheel to the bottom of the furrow wheel is the depth of ploughing. Yeah. So that determines the and you're ploughing for cereal grain. This, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why you're ploughing fairly shallow. Fairly shallow, yeah. 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 Four and a half inches, something like that. Yeah. What's uh, this, this thing here? That one actually takes the the vertical cut. So if you imagine it as a slice of cake really, that's slicing in vertical and then That share there, which actually takes Is that the what's called the coulter? The coulter, yeah, that's a coulter. Mm -hmm. um, and then the share, which takes the, the horizontal. Mm -hmm. You're basically taking a, a slicer there, and then a mould board, which actually does the turn. Mm -hmm. So that actually the steer slides along, and you turn it over. And the theory being, you invert the whole of the of the ground, so you're covering up all any weeds, any rubbish, if you're ploughing grassland, you're covering up the grassland. Um, that's about it. The one on the front there is we've got a skim cool, so that really is like a miniature plough. And that actually isn't working at the moment because we're not in ground that's got a lot of rubbish on the top. If you set that one down, that takes a tiny furrow from just in front of the coulter, the knife coulter, and that will then prevent any any grass or any stubble that's growing poking through there because you've taken that that little slice off with a spoon cutter. Yeah. You're playing with two horses now. Yeah. But uh, in medieval England they often had four, sometimes up to eight. Why would they have so many horses? I think two 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 reasons. One is the, is the technology of the plough. It wasn't until the sort of middle of the 17, 1700s, I think, that they developed this type of plough. So the other plant was actually a lot heavier. Mm. Uh, if you imagine that, once you've cut into that, although it's not easy, it's, it's easier than if you've got a, a mold board, which I think on the very primitive ones was almost just like a mm. slice of wood, mm. almost like a digging implement rather than a, than a turning implement. Uh, but two horses on, this is, this is medium land, it's getting on the clay side. If you were in heavy clay, pair of horses probably wouldn't pull it, you've gone three horses, sometimes four, um, and, and, and land often referred to as two horse land, meaning that you needed two horses 
single horse man, mm. three horse man, three horse mm. dog. It's a very, very rarely with a single horse mm. over the least of the horse. Yes. In the, in the south of Europe, you, they used to have very um, thin and, and insubstantial plows without any wheels at all, no. just scratching along the, uh, the top of the sort of sandy soil. Obviously up here in the north here, you can see what sort of wet and clay soil you've yeah. got up here. You really needed something very powerful to pull through yeah. this, didn't you? Yeah. And one ox would do nothing here, would it, really? No, you, 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 because of the, the, the literally because of the weight and the weight of pulling through, uh, you want something that just did a scratch, wooden scratch, which is this sort of heavy. Mm. So you've got here a very powerful machine for producing these. But in many societies, this is just the beginning of the agricultural process. And most of the labour in, for example, if you're growing rice, goes into weeding. Right. I mean, would you, how do you deal with the problems of weeds? We, weeding pre sort of chemicals, obviously, to kill weeds. It was a manual process, or as they're manual often, a horse implement process. If, if you plough, and this is the important thing, straight ploughing, if you plough and you sow broadcast, basically the seed will fall between the furrows. You harrow it over, and in theory, it comes up in nice straight rows. Now you can either send a man or a woman in to go along the rows and weed, or a horse hoe, which is pulled by a single horse, and it's set so that it just takes out the weeds from between, from between the crop. Uh, if you're growing root crops, the root crops are grown on a slightly wider, so it makes it a slightly easy job. And you can use a horse scuffle, which is the same principle, it pulls out, pulls out the weed. How in between the plants was still a, a hand, a hand but, a but it was only part of it. Oh yes, yes. So you, you overcome the problem. The other thing, I noticed these are quite long, yeah. um, straight bits that you're doing. One theory is that in the north of Europe, where you have these wheel ploughs and these horses teams, it was quite difficult to turn a plough like this, but especially if you say you had eight horses yeah. and you had a medieval plough. And so it's very difficult to turn it. And as a result, it, you've got these very long furrows in these fields. I think originally, I think furlong is, 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 is derived from furrow long, mm. which was a, some, something to do with the length of the mm. furrow that, mm. that, that, that the horses or the oxen could, could plough. Um, I think if, if you go back far enough, I think even with, with oxen, because you had, say, six or eight oxen, you ploughed, I think, in, in almost a figure of eight, which enabled you to turn round. Mm. Uh, when, by the time you get to horseback, often for the horses, and a plough like this, uh, you need about eight yards at the end, so you can, you can turn fairly easily. Mm. But, but once they've developed this, this type of plough. Okay, you want it, yeah. If you look at this rich, wet soil here, can you imagine the situation of some German Anglo-Saxon farmer who was trying to grow stuff on here in the 8th, 9th century? Basically, if he decided to do what they do in many parts of the world, which is to just get a spade and dig it, or get a hoe and uh, go at it like that, there, was, there would be very little chance, wouldn't there, Steve, of growing enough food to feed yourself. Yeah, that's, that's right. You need something, an implement that will turn the thing over and, and a fairly powerful animal to pull the thing. Yeah. Yes. So you basically had to be very inventive. You had to combine iron, once again, an iron implement with animal power. These hugely powerful machines, the first machines really before industrialization. This is the predecessor of the steam engine and you need to link the two together. And on the basis of that, and overcoming the appalling problems which we see today with all this rain and wetness and coldness and hard uh, and clay soil, if you can think of an ingenious mechanical solution to getting something out of the soil using those, these techniques, then you can make a, a, a reasonable living. In many societies, all you needed to do was to add water, seeds, and human labor you didn't need any of this paraphernalia at the beginning. You didn't need anything to turn the soil except human labour. So you don't get into this machine kind of invasive technology of the soil. You don't need to work at the soil with machines. Forget machines. Just use your own human back and strength and hack away at the soil and you can produce a decent living. So you're beginning here to 
supplement or replace human labour with machinery, whereas in many parts of the world you never need to do that. So you don't begin to think about machines which will help human beings. The extensions, I mean these horses are basically an extension or a supplement for our backs. Mm -hmm. They're slaves which are a sort of working to relieve our own backs. Mm -hmm. And although you know personally where it's quite hard work ploughing, it would certainly be harder work digging all this up oh, by hand. <laughs> So I think, I mean, we've probably said everything, which is that basically two kinds of worlds. One, muddy, wet, cold, but full of machines and animal machines, as well as steel and uh, iron machines. And the other, full of human beings working with their own arms, legs, and uh, nothing else. And so you begin to get the divergence of civilizations from the Middle Ages onwards. And one ends up with the Industrial Revolution and the other ends up with intensive rice cultivation. So, I think I'd rather be in Japan, I must say, but... I would today. <laughs> I would today. Anyway, thanks very much.